So our reading for today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verse 22 to 40. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped night and day fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was on him. May God bless the hearing and the living of this word. And further from the writings of Emanuel Swedenborg through Christianity number 530. The question then is, how are we to repent? The answer is, we are to do so actively. That is, we are to examine ourselves, recognize and admit to our sins, pray to the Lord and begin a new life. Afterward, if we abstain from one sin or another that we have discovered in ourselves, this is enough to make our repentance real. When we reach this point, we are on the pathway to heaven because we begin to turn from an earthly person into a spiritual person and to be born anew with the help of the Lord. So my friends, I have a question for you. Has anyone heard of something called the comfy? So this is a fun present that my daughter got for her birthday this year. It's basically a big cozy blanket that you can wear like an enormous sweater. It feels soft on the outside and fuzzy on the inside with a hood and everything. So one feels cocooned and warm wherever they might find themselves. And I know that this year, especially, we may well have wrapped ourselves in the fuzzy sweet warmth of Christmas because we have really needed it. But the lectionary doesn't allow us to stay in the soft sweetness of Christmas for long. It bids us emerge to wrap our heads around what Jesus' birth really meant to the people then and to us now. For yes, indeed, it is very moving that God would become so vulnerable for our sake. And we react instinctively to the beauty and vulnerability of babies. Then add the notion of someone so powerful like God choosing to become so vulnerable for love of us. 
and Christmas is just tailor-made to get us in the feels. But the story of the incarnation is not just about closeness, not just about solidarity or God wrapping us up in a big hug. This is mainly what we see very appropriately when we take in the broad view from a distance. We see God coming to earth, the stable and the manger with the star above, the shepherds on a hill with the angel host in the sky. At Christmas, we see the grand sweep of things. And I do often preach God's closeness and presence because it is such a comfort. But that is not all that God was up to with the incarnation. Closeness and presence are part of a loving response, a very important part, but not always the only part. So now it is time for us to zoom in a little closer on the incarnation. What exactly does the Christmas message of God's presence and love tell us? As Simeon prophesies, it won't be all warm, peaceful fuzzies. The baby will grow up and have a world-changing ministry, one that demonstrates what happens to us when we actually, truly allow God's presence into our lives. Simeon describes, as Mary did in her Magnificat, a great revealing. He describes opposition and confrontation, and he describes sacrifice. And so we see that the incarnation is not only about peace and joy. We see that God does mean to console us, but that God is not content with a there, there, band-aid kind of consolation that feels nice in the moment, but that we can forget the rest of the year. With the incarnation, God intended for us to be given a blueprint for true healing and true transformation. Something that gives us lasting consolation. True healing, true transformation often requires something that doesn't feel peaceful and happy at first. Confrontation and change. Father Richard Rohr describes the process like this. When the scriptures are used maturely and they become a precursor to meeting the Christ, they proceed in this order. One, they confront us with a bigger picture than we are used to, God's kingdom that has the potential to deconstruct our false worldviews. Two, they then have the power to convert us to an alternative worldview by proclamation, grace, and the sheer attraction of the good, the true, and the beautiful, not by shame, guilt, or fear. And three, they then console us and bring deep healing as they reconstruct us in a new place with a new mind and heart." End quote. The Christmas story begins with signaling where the process is going, peace, goodwill towards all people. But then Jesus starts living his life and that life leads us to the necessary deconstruction and reorganization that needs to occur before the reconstruction of our new selves can happen. Swedenborg calls this process repentance, reformation and regeneration. So first, repentance. Swedenborg calls this the beginning of the church within us. And he rightly points out that it is not the same thing as contrition or confession, which are just words, important words, but still just words. We teach our children to say, I'm sorry, when they have hurt someone, but only as a precursor to actually being sorry, actually having empathy for the one who has been hurt. And so repentance might begin with words, but it is a larger process in that. It is a process of examining ourselves in light of God's bigger picture, as Raw puts it, recognizing and admitting our sins, and then actually starting to act in a new way that no longer hurts others. Then reformation. As we act in this new way that no longer adversely affects others, 
our selfhood is reorganized by the Lord. Our willingness to act differently creates an opening and we are reformed little by little. For change cannot always be instantaneous. We all have habits and perspectives that take time to be reshaped and relearned and this will feel messy. But when we offer our intention and follow through consistently and faithfully, then God does something beautiful with that offering. And finally, regeneration, a rebirth. We are all served in some way by our sinful ways and perspectives. We receive ego safety or praise or power or any number of perceived benefits. And we will continue to feel the allure of all that even as we repent, even as we work to act differently. Sometimes that might mean we feel like we're just going through the motions. But when we do this for the sake of others, it's actually a good thing. The end point of reformation, though, is the reorganization of our selfhood. And that eventually we will do what is right and good naturally, easily, spontaneously, because it is all that we want. The peace and joy and consolation then flows because we no longer are captive to what serves our lower self. And this is the shape of all our spiritual journeys, a shape modeled for, by Jesus for us, played out over and over again in large and small ways. There are parts of this procedure that feel scary, but this is what faith is submission to a larger process that we believe in, even when it is not exactly clear how it will play out. But knowing that regeneration, consolation, is on the way if we have the willingness and the courage to do the work of allowing repentance and staying present to reformation. Regeneration, in essence, is constantly being born again. And this is how Christmas morning becomes unfettered from the day called December 25th. This is how Christmas becomes available to us anytime and all the time. This is what Jesus came for, not the gift of one day, but a gift for all days. And even though we have zoomed in on the process, the peace, joy, and consolation that we see in the wider view of the Christmas story is definitely still there. It is the undercurrent. It is the engine. It is the end game, and it holds all of the rest in place. But peace and joy and consolation have to come from somewhere to have real meaning in our lives, and they come from this process. The book of the prophet Malachi is the final book in the Old Testament. And among its final verses are thus. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. This is what we are left with right before we begin the story of Jesus' birth. The work of God in us feels both great and terrible. But just because it feels terrible sometimes doesn't mean that God isn't present to it, working in and through it. Simeon spoke of falling and rising and a sword that will pierce Mary's heart. But he also said, my eyes have seen your salvation. And that was enough for him to feel like he could leave this world in peace. Soon that salvation would unfold available to us all. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was on him. Amen. <laughs>